Hey, good morning. Here we are with Geography of the Western World, ready to go on our second day here. It is, in fact, 9.30, so we are ready to begin. <clears throat> I'll remind you that, yes, I really like it if I can see faces. And so if you want to turn your camera on, that would be a good thing. Again, that helps me get a good impression of you as a student. Uh, sometimes it's not feasible, and I understand that too. Okay, so last time was our first time, and it was our introduction. It was the syllabus, it was some business sorts of things so that we know what's going on today, what's going on through the semester. Today, then, I'm going to start on my themes category, and then uh, I think before we go, a couple reminders of some business sorts of things, too. Okay, so themes. I indicated last time that before we start any of our regions, I like to do themes, some things that help us create a framework, a background for the other things we'll do in the various regions. All right, so I'm going to share my screen and get started with that. Okay, my theme to start is, what is geography? Yeah, that's the beginning. That's a very fundamental question. If I were teaching in a different discipline, uh, maybe I wouldn't need this sort of first presentation. If I were teaching in history, maybe I don't need to tell you what history is. And probably not the study of things that went on in the past. If I were doing biology, if I were doing chemistry, would I need to explain to you what that is? Uh, maybe, but maybe not. However, in my experience, it is important in geography because we're a lesser known discipline to explain what we're doing in geography. So what if we asked random people, hey, what is geography? What if we went down to the train station in Glen Ellen and as people were waiting in the cold for their train to arrive, we asked them, what is geography? Well, if they were kind enough to give us an answer, I'm pretty sure that some of the people would say that geography, that's doing map quizzes. Well, you know, that's a little bit correct. Yes, we are going to do map quizzes. Yes, it is important to know where places are. And that's going to be a fundamental layer of what we do in geography. However, we do much more than just map quizzes. What else might that random person on the street say? Well, I think probably someone would reference the physical landscape. Knowing stuff about mountains, rivers, plains, deserts, all sorts of things like that, the physical landscape. Well, that too would be true. In fact, physical geography is a big section of geography. Now, this is a little bit interesting. Oh, this is done. In some colleges and universities across the country, physical geography is taught in the geography department. However, in some other colleges and universities, physical geography is taught as earth science. And at COD, that is how we do it. At COD, the earth science department teaches physical geography courses. Well, they call it earth science, and it is essentially the same thing. But that means that I, in my geography department, do not offer physical geography courses. So what do we do 
in geography. If we don't teach physical geography, there must be other parts of geography. Oh, yes, that is true. Human or cultural geography is another big chunk of geography. This is all sorts of things about people and places. Human geography. That random person on the street asked, what is geography? Pretty good chance they don't think of that. They don't realize about human geography. There's also technical geography. This is the map making sphere. And uh, well, you'll see a little bit later in the presentation how we started using computers to do that. OK, so what is geography? Well, it's going to be more than what that average person thinks. But yes, some of it will be map quizzes. And here I think there's a bit of irony. Probably the people who think that all of geography is map quizzes still would do poorly on map quizzes. Yeah, in truth, a lot of Americans don't do well on locating places, on knowing where places, especially outside of America, where places are. So yes, we're going to do map quizzes to see that you can do them and know where places are. And I'm going to argue that knowing where places are can make a difference in what people do and think. So for instance, in 2015, there was an outbreak of Ebola. Now, Ebola is a nasty disease, high death rates for people who catch Ebola. It is quite a bit different than our current pandemic, OK? COVID does, of course, kill people. We've had over 800,000 Americans die of COVID. But COVID takes a while to kill people. Ebola tends to be much faster. And that usually means that Ebola doesn't spread very far because the people who could spread it die quickly and don't have a chance to spread it very far. OK. But in 2015, there was this outbreak of Ebola in a section of Africa. And you see four countries listed there. I guess only eight people had died in Nigeria by January 16, 2015. So primarily these other three countries, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. OK, let's imagine. Let's imagine that you had been dreaming for many years of going on safari in Tanzania, Africa, a place that is famous for its animals and its safaris. That was your dream. And let's say you had saved up money for a long time and finally you had enough. You had enough money to arrange for that trip. And then you heard that Ebola had an outbreak in Liberia, and people were dying in Liberia of Ebola. Would you still book the trip to Tanzania? Well, it would depend on if you know where those places are. They're both in Africa, but where? Well, there's a handy little website that will tell us how far it is, how far it is from one to the other. So that little website is here. And what I need to do is type in the place. So I'm going to go from Liberia to Tanzania. How far is it? Well, the website tells us that by air, as the crow flies, the shortest distance would be 3,180 miles. But if we had to drive it, it would take over 4,000 miles to get there. Okay, so if you went on safari in 
Tanzania while there was an outbreak of Ebola in Liberia, are you at risk of the disease? Well, no, because it's 3,000 miles away. It'd be like you worrying that New York City was too close to Los Angeles. Well, in America, we know that those are far apart. But do we know about where places are in Africa, where places are in other parts of the world? Well, the curious thing is that when there was this Ebola outbreak, Tanzania had a sharp drop in tourism. Yes, a lot of people decided not to go to Tanzania because they were worried about getting Ebola. Not a good choice because they had no chance of getting Ebola. It was 3,000 miles away. A few years ago, uh, 2014, there was a survey taken by the Washington Post, and they asked people, where is Ukraine? They gave them this map and asked them to point to, where is Ukraine? All those dots are the answers they gave. As you can see, lots of people had no idea at all, where is Ukraine? And some of these are incredible. <laughs> What? I mean, America, United States, how could anybody suggest that's where Ukraine is? Come on, look up here. Lots of people chose Greenland. No, that is not Ukraine. Even a couple of people chose Australia. That is not Ukraine. Okay, wild answers. Now, to be fair, some people were correct. And the red cluster of answers is there, is Ukraine. Well, the survey then said, okay, do, that Ukraine is in a battle right now. Should we send American troops to Ukraine? The people who had no idea where Ukraine is tended to say, yes we should send American troops to Ukraine. The people who knew that it was next to Russia and that Russia was causing the trouble were likely to say, no, we should not send troops to Ukraine. Well, this turns out to be a hot topic right now in 2022, as Russian forces are adding up next to the border with Ukraine and the world is kind of waiting right now to see if Russia is going to invade Ukraine. Well, I hope that people who are making decisions know where it is, know where the place is, so that they can yeah, make good decisions. And it's not the people who think that Ukraine is up here making those choices. It helps to know where places are. It can affect your choices, your decisions, and help you make, well, at least informed decisions. Well, at least you've seen a world map. Yes? All right, I'm gonna switch to a little video here. And I want to make sure that I do it correctly. So I'm going to come out and go back and turn on the sound. Okay, this should work. Make sure I find the right spot. That was not the right spot. Here it is. Welcome forward. We are a new kind of doctor's office that's doing primary care differently. Hi, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry to be late. Not a problem. I'm CJ Craig. 
Of course you are. I'm Dr. John Fallow. This is Dr. Cynthia Sales and uh, Professor Donald Huke. Huke? Huke. Okay. So you should be able to hear the sound, but it's also printed. The words are printed on the video. So this is a clip from the West Wing TV show of some years back. And uh, three of the people who are saying they are geography professors, well, two actually are geography professors here. The man in the screen here talking to C.J. Craig is uh, not. He is an actor. Uh, and if you're a Star Trek fan like I am, you recognize him for playing Dr. Phlox in Star Trek Enterprise. All right. But here we're talking about geography. And you are the Organization of Cartographers for Social Equality. Well, we're, uh, we're from the OCSE. We have many members. How many? 4,300 dues-paying members. What are the dues? Uh, $20 a year for the newsletter. Let's start. Wait. Wait, I want to see this. This is Josh Lyman. Indeed you are. Josh, this is Dr. Fallow and Hi. his merry men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Should we begin? Yes. Plain and simple, uh, we'd like President Bartlett to aggressively support legislation that would make it mandatory for every public school in America to teach geography using the Peters projection map instead of the traditional Mercator. Give me 200 bucks and it's done. Really? No. Why are we changing maps? Uh, because, CJ, the Mercator projection has fostered European imperialist attitudes for centuries and created an ethnic bias <laughs> against the Third World. Really? The German cartographer, Mercator, originally designed this map in 1569 as a navigational tool for European sailors. The map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines of constant bearing or geographic direction. So it makes it easier to cross an ocean. But yes. it distorts the relative size of nations and continents. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh, dear, yes. Uh, look at Greenland. OK. Now look at Africa. OK. The two land masses appear to be roughly the same size. Yes. Would it blow your mind if I told you that Africa is in reality 14 times larger? Yes. Here we have Europe drawn considerably larger than South America. When it's 6.9 million square miles, South America is almost double the size of Europe's 3.8 million. Alaska appears three times as large as Mexico when Mexico is larger by 0.1 million square miles. Germany appears in the middle of the map when it's in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Wait, wait, wait. Relative size is one thing, but you're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing is where you think it is. Where is it? I'm glad you asked. The Peters projection. It has fidelity of axis. Fidelity of position. East-west lines are parallel and intersect north-south axes at right angles. What the hell is that? It's where you've been living this whole time. Should we continue? Uh-huh. So, you're probably wondering what all of this has to do with social equality. No, I'm wondering where France really is. Guys, we want to thank you very much for coming in. Hang on, we're going to finish this. Okay. What do maps have to do with social equality, you ask? She asked. Salvatore Natoli of the National Council for Social Studies argues, in our society, we unconsciously equate size with importance and even power. I'm going to check in on Tommy. Go. These guys find Brigadoon on that map. You'll call me, right? Probably not. OK. When third world countries are misrepresented, they're likely to be valued less. When Mercator maps exaggerate the importance of Western civilization, when the top of the map is given to the northern hemisphere and the bottom is given to the southern, then people will tend to adopt top and bottom attitudes. But wait, how, where else could you put the northern hemisphere but on the top? On the bottom. How? Like this. Yeah, but you can't do that. Why not? Because it's freaking me out. Because it's freaking her out. Hmm. If we're going to know, if we're going to know where places are, maybe we should also be aware about how maps are made and how different maps do different things. Cole, he's my miracle child. Wait a minute. What's going on? Where so how does your miracle child get cancer? Mm -hmm. How does that happen? 
there was a, uh, a mass. Stop, stop, uh, stop, stop, stop. Okay. All right, back here. Thank you. All right, so here is the famous Mercator projection that they mentioned in that clip there. And you can see that the very distinctive feature of this map projection is that Greenland looks to be the same size as Africa. When in fact, as they've said, it's nowhere near the size of Africa. Well, this is an example of the problem of taking a spherical surface or planet and trying to flatten it into a rectangle. Some people compare it to peeling an orange and trying to flatten out all that orange rind into a perfect rectangle. It doesn't work. Geometry doesn't allow a spherical surface to be equaled on a flat map. So something has to give, something has to be wrong, even if some other things can be right. So we might like the shape of countries to be correct. Indeed, in the Mercator projection, the shape of the countries, those are correct, but the size of the countries are wrong. Maybe we'd like the size to be wrong. Well, the size to be right. If the size is right, oh, then the shapes might be wrong. Maybe we'd like directions on the map to be correct. Then something else is going to be wrong. Well, Mercator created this map in the 1600s. And at that time, it was awesome. One of the things it provided great benefit for was direction. When people were sailing the open seas in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, man, it was awesome to have a map that would help you go across the ocean. Think about it. In those large wooden ships that were sailing across oceans, boy, knowing where you're going is really important. It didn't matter if Greenland was too big to someone who is sailing across the ocean. Okay. But Mercator projection maps ended up on school walls for a long, long time and, well, did give some people the impression that Greenland was the same size as Africa. Sure, you just look at it and you think, oh, okay. Well, that's not so good. So there are other map projections, many actually, that try to do different things. And they mentioned the Peters projection map in that video clip. That's one that indeed attempts to be much closer to accuracy, though again, can't quite do everything. So they've compromised on a few things. Different map projections for different purposes. Hey, bonus fact, bonus fact. In 2009, my murder mystery novel was published. Yes, I have a real publisher for my murder mystery novel. And the main character, the hero in my story, is named Mercator Eliason. Mercator, because of this map. And so in the book, I have a chance to have people say, what, what what's your name, Mercator? And then he gets to tell them a little bit about geography because of that. So, yes. All right, this map freaked her out on that clip. It's one of the so-called upside down maps. And we've got Australia right there in the top half, in the middle. Is that okay? Yes, it is. How do we choose what would be on the top of the map? Well, anything could because our world 
is a sphere, isn't it? And it's a sphere in the galaxy, in space. Is there really a top or bottom to the planet? No, it just would be how you would look at the planet from a distance. Well, most of us don't get a chance to do that, right? A few people get to go up in the space shuttle and they could be looking at our planet from any particular vantage point. And those would all be legitimate ways to then map the surface. We could put Australia at the top and the middle. But historically, most map makers have put Europe and North America at the top of the map. And then there is some thought that maybe this creates a bias. In a variety of things, don't we think that being on top is better? Think about sports, for instance. Where do you want your team to be in the standings? You want them to be on top because if they're on top, they're in first place. Yeah, in different ways, we often think being on top is better. So if North America and Europe are always on the top of world maps, maybe people looking at those maps, maybe even subconsciously feel it, well, these are the best places. These are the top places. These are yeah, better. Well, I don't think we want a map to just suggest that some places are better than others. Not a world map. The world map is to show you where the countries are, where the places are. If we're going to say one country is better than another, I think we should use data. We should use statistics. We should use facts about those places. And then, okay, then we could have some reasonable criteria to say this is better. But just where they are on a map shouldn't suggest that. So there is concern among some that, well, we should be more diverse with our maps and not always show North America on the top. This one, this perspective of the world, well, it's maybe not as useful but it would be a legitimate perspective. Look how huge actually the Pacific Ocean is there from this vantage point. Don't get to see too much land. Yeah, let's be conscious of how we're deciding to portray the world. What is most effective? Is being on top better? Take a look at this kind of wink, wink map here. The top 12 states to live in, shaded in by yellow. Are those the top, are those the best 12 states? No, they're just the ones that happen to be on the top of the page here. This is not a good map. This is supposed to be funny. It doesn't rate the states at all. It just says, oh, these are in the top of the page. Well, it's that same sort of thing. Are the North America and Europe supposed to be better because they're in the top of the map? No, let's choose better by using real criteria. Okay, so now I have some definitions of geography for you to know so that we understand, yes, what is this thing, geography? And I'm going to start with what I call definition zero because it's not good enough, but it is something. It's place identification. It was going to include map quizzes. All right, but definition number one, I do like, yes, geography is the study of the spatial distribution of phenomena. The study of the spatial distribution of phenomena. So three key pieces of that sentence, study. All right, I like that that word is in here. Yeah, we're serious about this. We're serious like studying science, like studying chemistry, like studying history, whatever it is. Sure, we're serious about studying geography. So what can we then 
study. Well, phenomena. Remember, phenomena is the plural. Phenomenon, that's one thing. Phenomena, more than one thing. Well, that could then be lots of things that geographers can study. So we say, well, if those things have a spatial distribution, which usually means that they're found somewhere on the Earth's surface. Even so, that, that's a lot of things that geographers can study. And it means that sometimes we have overlaps with other fields of study. So here's an illustration of how that might be. Some things that economists study, so do geographers. And the overlap of those things is, well, economic geography. But the economist will have their own way of studying things. Geographers have their own ways of studying things. There's going to be different approaches. So they might study the same topic, but from different angles, which could be beneficial. Similarly, political geography is where geography and political science overlap. So for instance, elections. Some political, some political scientists study elections. Some geographers study elections. That can be a point of overlap. But political scientists will have their way of doing it. Geographers will have their way of doing it. For instance, maybe the political scientists will take into account location when studying elections, but maybe not. Maybe the political scientist is studying the political platform of one of the parties running in the election, and maybe it's not connected to locations. However, the geographer will always consider the location in whatever they study including elections. For instance, we here are in DuPage County, right? And historically, DuPage County tends to vote more Republican. If you look at the historical record, more Republicans have gotten elected in DuPage County than Democrats. The geographer wants to know, is that random? Is that just random chance? Well, usually geographers like to say, no, whatever we're looking at, it's probably not random. There may be a reason for it. Can we figure out if location is part of that reason? Okay, well, we're in DuPage County. What is it about DuPage County that might cause more Republican votes? Is it something about the physical landscape? I, I don't think so. Rolling hills of DuPage County, does that affect how people vote? I don't think so. It's probably not the physical geography, it's probably features of the human geography. Okay, one example would be that DuPage County is one of the wealthier counties in the whole state of Illinois. Maybe that is related to more Republican votes. Our neighbor is Wheaton. Wheaton is a somewhat conservative religious community. Maybe that affects more votes for Republicans. Maybe there's other things. But the geographer would ask, what is it about the place, the people and this place that maybe could affect how people vote? So whatever geographers are studying, it is partly the location. Where is that place? We'd like to be sure we know where it is. And then can we figure out if that affects what happens in that place? So know this, know the geographer's motto, location matters. Whatever we study, we include the location. That motto is similar to this motto, location, location, location. This motto is the real estate agent's motto. 
This is what realtors know. The location of the property affects the value or the price of the property. I'll give you my personal story. My family and I used to live in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Quite a few years ago, lived in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And we bought a house there. That house was two stories high, was built in the 19 teens. So it's just a bit over 100 years old now. Oh, we thought it was a fairly charming house, had some nice woodworking features inside. The lot was about an average size lot, a little bit of a backyard. And uh, oh, the street there was a T intersection, which was kind of handy. We didn't have a lot of cars going through. And we could walk from there to a nice city park. Well, then I got the job here at College of DuPage. So we moved here and at first we bought a house in Lombard. That house was built in the 19 teens. That house was two stories, fairly charming, even some nice woodworking inside. That house was on a typical size lot with a modest backyard. That street had a T intersection and from the house, we could again walk to a nice city park. It's even kind of funny how similar the property was. But which cost me more money, the Sioux Falls house or the Lombard house? The Lombard house is the answer. The Lombard house cost me two and a half times as much as the Sioux Falls house. Yet they were so similar. What was the difference? The difference was location. Sioux Falls, South Dakota at the time was about 100,000 people. The biggest city in all of South Dakota compared to Lombard. Actually, fewer people technically in Lombard, but part of this whole metropolitan area of Chicago with lots more people. Western suburbs of Chicago, quite a bit different location than Sioux Falls. That was the difference. Huge difference in the cost. The real estate agent knows that location, location, location. The geographer knows that location matters. All right, uh, I put question uh, 1A in there. Sometimes you'll see this definition of geography. It's very similar to mine. And I've added now definition number two. Geography is the art and science of location. I really like this definition as well. Geography is the art and science of location. There's the word location in there again, ties up with the motto location matters. So what is it? It's the art and science of location. So uh, this one is from the GR for George Dempko, the art and science of location. So art, I think of this in two ways. One, sometimes people frame maps, especially older or antique maps, sometimes are framed and put on walls as art. Secondly, there is an art of map making. There's an art of map making. It depends on what the purpose of the map is. Do you make a map to be effective, to show a pattern, to allow a process? Road maps, for instance, have a very specific purpose, right? Do you create the map so it can fulfill that purpose? There's an art of making maps. But also there is a science of map making. You probably know that there are laws of physics, right? You've probably heard that phrase, laws of physics. 
Uh, once again, if you're a Star Trek fan, and back in the original series, Scotty often seemed to say to the captain that he could not change the laws of physics. But did you know that there are laws of geography? And this one is the most important law. Know this law of geography. It's Tobler's first law of geography. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. So this comes into the category of science. This is a law. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. Some of this is just common sense that things that are close by have a greater impact or effect than things that are far away. All right, just an easy example. My wife's brother lives in Portland, Oregon. My brother lives in Milwaukee. We like both of these men. They're both good people. Which of the brothers do we see more often? Milwaukee brother. Why? Is it he's a better guy? No, it's not a measure of better persons. No, he's just close. Milwaukee's not that far away. Portland, Oregon. Well, yeah, we don't just get up and drive to Portland, Oregon for the weekend, whereas we could do that easily for Milwaukee. This fits into Tobler's first law. Everything's related to everything else, but near things like Milwaukee, are more related than distant things like Oregon. All right, now let's put the art and science together in what we call GIS. GIS is Geographic Information Systems, and GIS is now the computer way of making maps. So we're taking the art of map making and the science of computing and putting it together in GIS. If you like maps and you like computers, GIS is a good field. In fact, here at CRB, we have a GIS certificate. You take five sequential GIS pro, uh, courses, learning the software and how to do GIS, and then there's one other, what I call a content course that you select from a list and you get a certificate in GIS. We've had some really good success in getting people uh, jobs and internships from this GIS program. All right, and a famous story that I like that gives us the old school way of doing this and how we could do this now with the computer is the story of a outbreak of cholera in London. And I have a nice way of showing this. Here. So uh, some years ago, I think it was 2014, there was a TV series called Helix. It was a sci-fi program on the sci-fi channel, Helix. And this is a segment from the first episode. Don't think this has the text built in, uh, but you should be able to hear the sound. Presentation starts in five minutes. Oh, it I does can't have find the it. Words to you. Great. Did you look under the desk? Why would it be under the desk? That's where I found your seaboard medal. How hard can it be to find a 160-year-old pump handle? Depends. On what? On who's doing the finding. Where did you? Where you left it. You're a lifesaver. So I've been told. In 1854, London experienced a terrible cholera outbreak. Local doctors attributed the epidemic to miasma, or bad air. And they responded to it by burning incense and promoting the sale of fragrant flowers. 
<laughs> not, as you might imagine, terribly helpful to the 600 or so who died of the disease, but a doctor and a clergyman mapped out the victims. And this was the very first epidemiological study. What they found was a cluster of cases around Broad Street, where there was a city water pump. Defying the local authorities, they did the unthinkable. They took off the handle. <laughs> and the outbreak came to an end. But the lesson lives on. And so, unfortunately, does cholera. When a surgeon fumbles, a patient dies. When we drop the ball, thousands die. As new CDC field officers, you are about to embark on a mission to the far corners of the earth. And you will witness horrors others cannot imagine. Horrors that make cholera seem tame. You will make sacrifices that others find unthinkable. And your family and your friends will sacrifice right along with you. And you will do all of this because you cannot fathom living any other life. This is no game. Mistakes are very real. That's just scotch in there, by the way, single malt. In fact, toss it back. <laughs>
Can we describe the place? Can we describe the physical geography? Can we describe the human geography? What is at that place? Well, National Geographic Magazine, that's one of the ways that this is done. Your free online textbook does this, describes places. Yes, there's a variety of ways we can do this, describe places. So that's our second step or level. Our third level is the most complicated, is the most difficult. It's the analysis. And that sounds more difficult, doesn't it? The analysis of resulting patterns and processes. Resulting. So now we're still asking where, but we're adding on how and why. How and why do things happen at that location? The geographer tends to suggest it's not random chance, but there may be some cause, there may be some reason, and it may be geographic, it may be about people and places. So the Jarf thinks if we can describe what is at a place, we may be able to explain then what happens at that place. I think a good example is migration. In many cases, and often in the United States, migration is done by comparing places. Where do I live now? Okay, well, I know where I live now, and I know what it's like. I know what good things are here where I live now. I know if there are any bad things about living here. And I know that a lot of things are just kind of neutral. They're not really bad or good. They just are. Okay. That's where I am. That's where I live. But maybe I'm thinking I might move to some other place, maybe far away or maybe just pretty short distance. How do I decide? Well, I try to figure out what that other place is like. What are the good things of that place? Are there any bad things in that other place? And again, I'm sure a lot of things are kind of neutral, just are. Well, then I weigh these two things, these two places and their locational characteristics. If I decide that the other place is quite a bit better than where I live now, okay, then I should move and go to that place. If I decide that where I'm living now is better than where I might go live, of course, then I should stay where I am. And sort of in the middle, if that other place looks just a little better than where I am, maybe it's not worth the hassle and cost of moving. But a migration very often is that comparison of the features of the places, of the locations. That's very geographic then, comparing the geographies of these two places. And then if the migration occurs, that's across geographic space. So that is geographic as well. All right, so these are my three levels then of geographic study. We're gonna do all of them in different ways in this course. Okay, and throughout all of that then, geographers of course like to use maps. And in looking at maps, we often look for spatial patterns. Are there things we can see with the map? And maybe it's the map that allows that. Um, have you heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words? Well, maybe we'd say a map is worth a thousand points of data. We could look at a page of numbers and it might be hard to figure out a pattern just by looking at the numbers. But if we could map that, we might see a very obvious pattern. All right, so here's an interesting map. Percentage of light colored eyes in Europe. Okay, and so when 80% or more of the people's eyes are light or bluish okay then they're shaded in the light blue on this map and then it progressively goes to a dark brown dark brown being one to 19 percent of the people have light colored eyes well looks like there's a pattern here 
doesn't it? It's not just random which people have light colored eyes. Yeah, there's a geographic pattern. Now, of course, this is a genetic pattern as well. What genes you inherited from your parents in terms of eye colors? Well, geographers like to map all sorts of things to see if there are patterns. For instance, this map comes from Twitter, Twitter data. Geographer analyzed a bunch of Twitter data and looked for the word damn in tweets. And this shows the frequency that the word damn showed up. So more common in tweets in the American South there, damn. And less common in the North. And you can look for Chicago there and it looks like we're kind of right in the middle about average there, we're in that light tan color there. Well, uh, they went beyond the word damn to some words that I don't usually say, like this word here, another four letter word. So this one, it's fairly similar in the tweets where people said this one. Although look at Chicago, we rank a little bit higher. We say this one a little more in tweets than we said damn. Right? Or, okay, the big one. Um, well, this one's a bit different, isn't it? The South still has some of it, but boy, California jumped out here. Uh, in the Northeast jumped out here on people who say this one, the F word. And Chicago, too, come out fairly high on this. Now, I grew up in southwestern Minnesota, and you can see it's in blue here on this score. So when I was growing up, we did not often use the F word on tweets when I was a boy in Minnesota. Of course, there was no Twitter at all when I was growing up as well. All right, so now I've got a question for you thinking about maps. And I'd like to, you to put your answer in the chat. And this will be how I no, if you were here today, okay, this will be my record. And so answer something to this question by putting your answer in the chat, and then I'll tabulate them and mark you down as being here. So it's a sports question. It's about the NBA professional basketball. Which team do you hate the most in the NBA? Now, if you're not a sports fan, if you don't follow basketball, if you don't know many teams in the NBA, okay, that's fine. Say that in the chat. Say, I don't follow the NBA. But otherwise, yeah, which team do you hate the most in the NBA? Put your answer now in the chat, please. In a moment, uh, we'll look at the list and we'll see what you have said. And then I'll show you a map of our country of what people have said to this kind of poll question. All right, so, so far 11 of you have answered 12 of you, or it's 12 things in the chat anyway, 14. All right, let's take a look at what you've been saying. So I see quite a few, uh, let's see, there's the Lakers, the Celtics are mentioned there. Back up here, all right. Here's the chat. It's funny, I can see it on one screen and not on the other screen here. All right, so we've got a variety of answers there in the chat. Uh, how about what was done in using data? This comes from Twitter also. So people hate what? Well, the purple is the Los Angeles Lakers. So that is a fairly common answer across the country. Uh, the blue, that's the Golden State Warriors. There are some who hate the Golden State Warriors. Then there's a few other smaller answers. So in California, the team hated the most is the LA Clippers. Undoubtedly, this is a rivalry with the Los Angeles Lakers. Okay, and uh, the Houston Rockets are the team hated most in Oklahoma or in Utah. And maybe rivalry with teams there, the OKC team and the Utah Jazz team. Okay, 
but it's the Lakers who are hated the most here overall. Well, that is also true for me. I hate the Lakers the most. That's because I am a Boston Celtics fan, and that has been their longtime historical rivalry. So, okay, well, here's one more way of mapping something. Geographers like to map things. All right. Okay, good. That's what is geography. Okay, good. And we have a few minutes left. So I want to use those few minutes left to remind you of a couple things and to show you some things. Okay, so first to remind you that I sent you some uh, links after class last time, some links of videos you can watch that are how to how to make a map quiz tip, how to produce a Padlet canvas, how to post on the discussion board. Okay, so watch those at your leisure, but soon, I think. And in particular, the discussion board. There are, well, different ways you can post on the discussion board. I sent you an explanation about that, but you should be reading the chapters in the textbook and starting to at least post on some of those chapters. In the discussion board, chapter folders disappear after a week. So you want to submit something about a chapter, you got a week's time to do it. So keep that time frame in mind. Okay, that's very important to keep reading the textbook and to fairly regularly post in the discussion board. You don't have to post about every chapter, but you want to average about 17 points of discussion board post each week. And you remember there's three ways of getting three points, a two point way and a one point way to get points by posting in the discussion board. That was sent to you uh, one of the things. Okay, so you wanna be doing that. Well, I also wanna just show you two examples here today, one for a map quiz tip and one for a Padlet canvas. So let me find those here. Okay, I'm going to go back to share my screen to show you a map quiz tip example. Okay, so map quiz tip, where is the Gulf of Carpentaria? Well, if you don't know, that's no surprise. Most people don't have a clue where this is, but we're going to know as we do map quizzes, of the first one on the Pacific realm. Where is the Gulf of Carpentaria? Well, to me, the name reminds me of the carpenter, the person who does that job, often creating things out of wood, right? A carpenter. One of the carpenter's tools is a hammer. Imagine taking a hammer and going bam, to the top side of Australia there, the north side of Australia. And look, oh, there's a dent now in the north side of Australia. Imagine the hammer, bam, hitting there. And that fills in with ocean water, and that's the Gulf of Carpentaria. So I'm hoping now you will all remember where the Gulf of Carpentaria is, because I hope this was a fun little way of thinking about that. That's my example of a map quiz tip. It's two slides in PowerPoint. It's at least one slide showing the map. And then it's some way of getting us to remember. Hopefully it's a clever way, an imaginative way you can use an image like this of the hammer, you can create a jingle, you can create an acronym, you, well, be imaginative. Something to help us all get this one right when we later do the map quiz. So I sent you a link to show you where to sign up for the map quiz tips. And I sent you a link to the video 
that shows how to create a map quiz tip, but here now is one example for you to see as well. All right, similarly, I sent you a link about how to create a Padlet Canvas, and I sent you a link for signing up for your first Padlet Canvas. But here is then an example of a Padlet Canvas. Okay, so three years ago, a student created this one for Washington State for me. So he's got a nice colorful background there to the canvas. Your original canvas is just blank. You get to put things on the canvas. She's got her name. She's got a title up in the top cor left corner. But the key thing is she's identified three things to know about the state of Washington. And we're striving to find three things that are not just trivia, not just random facts, but help us ideally geographically, help us have a sense, have some sense about yeah, how living there would be, what this place is like. So her first thing was, thanks to the rain shadow effect, the state is divided up into two climates. And she's got a visual with that, this photograph from the state. Her second thing, Nicknamed the Evergreen State for its endless amount of forest with evergreen trees. And there's a visual with that, this picture, including a map. And we see a lot of green, especially on the western side here of the Cascade Mountains going here and on the western side. Number three, Washington has the largest ferry system in the United States. And there's a photograph of one of the ferry boats there. And that's not just trivia, because Wash there's a reason why Washington has this large ferry system. It's because of Puget Sound here, and a lot of population on both sides of Puget Sound, but especially Seattle there on the east side. So there's a lot of movement of people across the Puget Sound there, and many go by ferry boat. All right, so she's got three things, and she's got an image for each of the three things. That's the main part of creating a Padlet Canvas. So on the day to present the Padlet Canvas, she will have sent me the link. I will then have this ready on the screen. And then I would say, OK, Abby, now tell us about your Padlet Canvas. And Abby would turn her video on, turn her audio on, and would then casually it's not a formal presentation, can you just say, okay, here's my Padlet wall, I have three things. And she would just quickly tell us without just reading everything, but just tell us there's a rain shadow effect in Washington state. It divides the state in two. The mountains are the dividing point. The Western side is a lot wetter. The evergreen forests then are not surprisingly on the wetter side of the state. And a key element of the western side is Puget Sound, where so many ferry boats are. Something like that would be how she would present her Padlet canvas. It's not a formal presentation. It probably takes about a minute to show and comment on what you have there. OK, so that's my example for you of the Padlet canvas. Okay, so that is it for today. Today you have shown that you're in attendance by putting something in the chat on the NBA question. It's good to see some of your faces today. And if we can see more faces in the future, that would be awesome too. That helps me and I think it makes a better situation for you too. Again, I don't require it because I know some things, some days maybe it's not feasible for you to have your camera on, but it helps me get a good impression of you when your camera is on. Okay, so if you have any questions, I'll hang on after class now, but otherwise you're good to go. Start posting in the discussion board, look at the video links, sign up, read the chapters, 
the early chapters in the textbook. All right, see you on Tuesday.